Our sermon today is taken from Exodus 21 through 11. This is the word of God. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Thus says the Lord. Amen. All right, so if you've been with us for the past few weeks, then you know we've been going through, past few months, you know we've been going through uh, the series through the life of Moses, and we're just going through uh, the Exodus, the book of Exodus. We're going to continue this till the end of the year. And right now, we're in Exodus chapter 20, where God gives Israel... The famous Ten Commandments. I was originally going to preach all Ten Commandments in one go, but after studying it, I quickly realized that there is way too much in here to talk about in, in one sermon. So what we're going to do is going to break up the Ten Commandments to two sections. Today, I'm going to talk about Commandments number one to four, and next Sunday, Gray is going to preach on Commandments number five to ten. Now, why break it up like that? Why break it up uh, between Commandments one to four and five to ten? Because that's how Jesus breaks it up in the New Testament. Where is that? Well, we just read on our call to worship earlier. Look at your uh, printout. Matthew chapter 22. Jesus was asked, right, uh, which commandment is the greatest one? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. That's the great and first commandment. That's the breakup. So the first set of commandments is about a vertical commitment, a vertical love to the Lord your God. You see that? And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's a horizontal commandment between you and how you're to treat others. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. You see, Jesus summarized the, the, the law, the first section, to the things that pertain to loving God, a vertical commitment, and that's what uh, commandments one to four is all about, right? Have no gods before him. Don't make idols. Don't use God's name in vain and keep the Sabbath. That's a, that's a vertical between us and God kind of relationship. And then the second section, that per, it pertains to loving others. It's the horizontal kind of commitments, which is commandments number five to ten. Honor your parents. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't covet. Do you, you see the breakdown there? Commandments one to four and five to ten. That's where we're dividing it this way because that's how Jesus did it. So before we start... All we're going to talk about is commandments one to four, the first section, okay? Be before we start, let me just remind us of why God gave Israel the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. Well, it's connected to what God said last week as we studied in Exodus chapter 19. Remember last week in Exodus chapter 19, God said, Israel is to be what? A holy nation. Do you remember that? A nation, holy just means set apart, a nation that's distinct, a nation that's different than all the other nations around them. Now, how are they going to do this? Well, this is where the Ten Commandments come in. This is how Israel is going to be distinct from all the other nations by obeying these Ten Commandments. Now, notice something very important. A lot of people think the Ten Commandments are ten moral laws, these ten moral laws is what's going to make Israel distinct from other nations. Uh, in other words, the Ten Commandments, a lot of people think, is just really all about our behavior. But remember, the behavioral horizontal type commandments, they only come in in commandments number five to ten. 
You see, commandments number one to four is not primarily concerned about Israel's horizontal behavior and how they treat one another. It's primarily concerned about Israel's vertical theological claims. Right? This means what makes God's people distinct from other people is not only their behavior, but it's also their theological claims. In in our culture today, I I hear, at least I think I hear many Christians say, you know, our theology isn't important. Theology is not important. You know, it's all about our actions. It's all about what we do. It's not about our theological truth claims. We can't really say that because commandments number one to four says the reason why you're distinct is because you have a distinct theological claim compared to all the other nations. Yes, it's about our moral behavior. So you can't just say it's all about theology. It's all about theology. It's not about how we live our lives. You can't say that either because commandments 5 to 10 is all about how you live live your lives. See, what makes God's people distinct from other nations is both their theological claims, that's different, and also the way they love and treat one another. Okay? So today, all we're going to talk about is commandments 1 to 4, the distinct theological claims Israel is to have, different than all the other nations. And what I think we'll see as we study them, is that, yes, these these first four commands are commandments, but I think you'll find them sounding awfully close to wedding vows. How so? Let's let's get to it. And and please don't throw rocks at me today for doing this, but instead of our normal three points, I'm going to have five points. Um, Yay, I know. (laughs) Please don't split the church because of it. Everything will be okay. All right, point one, an uncoerced love. Point two, a demand for exclusivity. Point three, a desire for awe. Point four, a holistic change. Point five, an infinite cost. An uncoerced love, a demand for exclusivity, a desire for awe, a holistic change, and an infinite cost. All right, point one, an uncoerced love. Let's start at verses one to two of our passage. Notice, verse 1 and 2, God has not yet here started with a command. This is not, a, this is not the, the Ten Commandments yet. It's just the introduction to the Ten Commandments. But even here, even here, we already find something that makes Israel holy or set apart or distinct or different from all the nations around them. Look at verses 1 to 2. Before God gave them any commandments, and God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Okay. How does this introduction make Israel distinct from all the other nations? See, all the other nations around them at the time, which I think is very similar to many religions today, treated their gods in a quid pro quo kind of way. What I mean by that is that if they obey their gods, their gods will bless them in return. That's the order of things. I first obey, you then bless. That's how they operated. First comes obedience, then comes love and blessing. But Yahweh is saying her to Israel, it's interesting. He's saying we're different, our relationship. I saved you first. I freed you out of Egypt first before I gave you the Ten Commandments. Isn't that weird? What does this mean? This means, unlike any other gods, Yahweh's love for his people is not dependent upon their obedience to him. If it was, then he would have given them the Ten Commandments before he freed them out of Egypt, right? And then dependent upon their obedience to these commandments, then he would decide to save them or not. Isn't that interesting? Because now we're forced to ask ourselves, then why did God commit to these group of people? Why did God decide to love and free these group of people if it's not because of their obedience? The answer, I think, we'll find in his name. Look at how he describes himself in verse 2. I am the Lord. The Lord there is Yahweh. I am Yahweh, your God. Remember what the word Yahweh, the name Yahweh means? God gave us a definition of what it meant in Exodus chapter 3. Remember that? When, When Moses met God in the unburning bush, Moses asked God, who are you? And Yahweh said what? Do you remember? I am the great I am. Now that sounds like a cassette tape, a, a cassette tape stuck in repeat, right? I am the great I am, the great I am, the great I am. <laughs> it's like, what's the point there? What's, what's God trying to say with this self-repetitive 
description. He's trying to say that he is because he is. He does because he does. He acts because he acts. In other words, he is not dependent upon anything else to do anything, to exist, to act, to decide, to think. He is because he is. He decides because he decides. So then, why does he love? He loves because he loves. Because he loves. But see, we as humans, we have a hard time trying to compute that. That kind of reasoning. It's just, it's hard for us to imagine a being who is completely uninfluenced by anything, unmanipulated to decide on anything. So we always go back to this quid pro quo philosophy, this legalistic, I do this, you give me that philosophy, like, like other religions, and we start speculating, you know. The rich speculates. Maybe it's because I'm a rich philanthropist. Maybe because I have a lot of money and I do a lot of good for the society. Maybe that's why I've impressed God. Maybe that's why he loves me. But the poor can also speculate, financially speaking here. Maybe it's because I've, I've suffered in humble poverty. That's why God pities me. That's why his passion for me is ignited. The moralist may also speculate, maybe it's my character. Maybe my character has impressed God. That's what made him love me. The religious speculates, maybe it's all my religious duties. Maybe it's me checking off all the religious boxes. Maybe that's what made God love me. And in verse 2 of our passage, God is saying, stop. Stop looking for a reason. There is nothing in you that influenced my love for you. I love you because I am who I am, and I love who I love. Uncoerced, independent from the influence of anyone and anything. And I've said this before in my past sermon. This may be worth repeating. A preacher uh, used this analogy to explain this point. He asked the ladies in the room, ladies, if you ask your husbands or your boyfriends, you know, sweetie, why do you love me? And he starts giving you reasons. I love you because you're physically attractive. I love you because you're rich. I love you because you're popular. I love you because you're fun. I love you because you make me a better person. That's sweet, right? That's, that's affirming. But there's a 20, tiny question that lingers there, isn't there? And the question is, well, if, if that's the reason why you love me, what will happen 40 years from now when I'm no longer those things? And what, if, what if 40 years from now I'm no longer physically attractive? What if you find somebody richer than me? What if you find somebody younger than me? Somebody funner than me? What if I lose my popularity? What if I'm no longer a good life coach for you and make you a better person? If, if there's a specific reason for his love, then what will happen when that specific reason no longer exists? That's the question we always ask and, and produce anxiety. You know, you might say here if you're not married yet or dating or just married, but we'll always love each other and make each other laugh. Just, just get married. <laughs> Let's go ahead and do that. But what if when you ask, you know, sweetie, why do you love me? And then he answers this, honey... There are many reasons of why I'm attracted to you. But to be honest, even if you lose all those attributes, even if your skin starts to sag, even if you lose all your popularity, your sense of humor, if you end up dirt broke, I won't lose my love for you. Why? Because at the end of the day, I love you because I love you. Because I love you. You see? There's a permanence to a love that loves simply because it loves. You should be suspicious when a human being tells you that, but when God does. <laughs> I'm different, God says here in verses 1 to 2. From all the other false gods out there, you didn't make me love you, so therefore you can't make me unlove you. <laughs> it's bizarre, which leads us to our second point a demand for exclusivity. Okay, so now we get to the first command here in verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. Verse 1 and 2, I love you because I love you because I love you. So now verse 3, make me your one and only. You see, wedding vows. Remember, every other nation back then, they had multiple gods. 
Like Egypt, we studied it right there. The sun god, the cow god, the frog god, the, the god of the Nile. But you, Israel, unlike all the other nations around you, in verse 3, God is saying, you are going to be distinct. You are only to have me as your one and only. So in verses 1 to 2, God is calling Israel to be distinct from the other nations by rejecting legalism. I do this, God gives me that kind of mentality. Okay? And in verse 3, God is calling Israel to be distinct from other nations by rejecting polytheism, the worship of multiple gods. You see the connection there? God is saying to Israel, don't treat me as someone you can just obey to get something out of legalism. And then leave me for another when you're done with me. Polytheism. You see that? And the wording here is weird, isn't it? It feels like God should have said this. It feels like God should have said, commandment number one, there exists no other gods before me. That would be true. But instead, he worded it like this, you shall have no other gods before me, as if there exists other gods and Israel is not allowed to worship them. Is that the case? No. God here isn't acknowledging the existence of other gods. He's acknowledging the fact that our hearts tend to make things that are not gods into gods. Idolatry. There is only one I am, God is saying here. There's only one being who all other beings depend on and who is not dependent upon any other being. The definition of ultimacy means there can only be one of them. And he alone is to be worshipped. But yet, do we not like Egypt? And other nations back then often elevated, elevate creatures, not, not ultimate beings, but creatures, not self-defining things, into the end-all, be-all, into the source. That, that's why we're often disappointed. You know how sturdy, you know how constant, you know how unchanging and sufficient something must be in order to carry the weight of your hopes and expectations? No creature can do that. Your parents, as great as they are, they can't, they can't be that for you. Your kids, as, as good as they are, they can't be that for you. Your spouse, as amazing as they may be, they can't be that for you. Your career can't be that for you. When you make those things ultimate and you expect them to do things only God can, they'll fail your expectations and you'll crush them under the burden of your expectations. It won't work, but yet we do that all the time, right? God here is saying, he alone, he is, he is all sufficient. He is independent. He is the self-defining great I am. He alone can be that for you. We must therefore place him in a position of awe, place him in a position transcendent from any other created things, which leads us to our third point, a desire for awe. Look at verses four to six, which is, which is the second commandment says this, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. God is saying here, you shall place me in a position of awe, high above all other things. How? By not mixing me up, the creator, with creature. You cannot, you can't do that. There has to be a gap. Okay, how do we do this? In two ways. First, verse four. We shall not elevate anything that is created into God's status, whether that thing be in the heavens above, the sun, the moon, or in the earth beneath, cows, frogs, career, romantic relationships, family members, or that is in the water under the earth, fishes, crabs, baby sharks, I have a two-year-old, that song is just in my head. <laughs> Nothing, the point here, there's a holistic sky, earth, you know, see, nothing. There is nothing in creation that you shall elevate and worship to God's status where you shall find ultimate source of identity, purpose, and hope. But second of all, by implication, just as we shall not elevate created things into God's status, we should also not humiliate God to creature status. How? For example, by bowing down to a photo of Jesus. There has to be a distinction or bowing, bowing down to a wood, craving of the a wood, wood carving of the cross. You're, you're mixing up the creator and creature distinction that God is saying, don't, you can't touch that. That is also prohibited here, okay? The intermixing of creator and creature can happen both ways, one, by elevating creature into God form, and two, by humiliating God into creature form. 
we shall do neither. Either one of those acts, look at the end of verse 5, will evoke what? This is intense. The jealousy of God. Don't intermix it, creator and creature. This is another way Israel is to be distinct from other nations. So, verse 1 to 2, Israel is to be distinct from other nations by rejecting legalism. Okay? Verse 3, Israel is to be distinct from other nations by rejecting polytheism, the worship of many gods. Verses 4 to 6, Israel is to be distinct from the other nations by rejecting pantheism. Pantheism claims God is in everything. God is in the trees. God is in the dirt. God is in the animals, right? God is in my dog, Toby. Christians acknowledge that God's presence is everywhere, but pantheist goes beyond that and says God is actually one with nature. We can't do that. God is saying here in commandment number two, if you do that, you'll end up like all the other nations around you who would localize the presence of God to a thing, an over-spiritualized thing, and do not therefore hold their gods in a position of absolute transcendent awe. Which is, by the way, the point of commandment number three in verse seven. Don't use my name in vain. In other words, don't use my name flippantly. Put me in a position of awe. Remember, remember God in the Old Testament associates very closely with his name. To use his name flippantly is like treating God flippantly. God is saying, don't do that. Keep me in a position of awe in your life. But, but, but what are the specific prohibi prohibitions of this command of not using God's name in vain? What can we or can't do? How far is too far in using God's name in vain? Can I say o OMG? You know, or are there phrases like that? Is that okay? Well, if we're asking how far is too far, I think we've already missed the point. If, if I ask my wife, you know, hey, babe, now that we're married, how far can I flirt with other girls until it's too far? If I ask that question, Tati will respond, honey, you've missed the point of marriage. Although she would say it not that calmly, I assure you that. <laughs> if I love my wife, I wouldn't be asking that question in the first place. How far is too far? What? If I truly am in awe of God, I wouldn't be asking that question in the first place. We, we'd be asking the opposite question. How much can I elevate your name? How much can I treat it with reverence and awe that it deserves? Okay, let's summarize. Israel, God's people, be holy, be distinct, be different. How? First, don't be legalistic. I love you because I love you because I love you. Two, don't be polytheistic. Don't, don't worship other gods. Make me your one and only. Uh, third, don't be pantheistic or blasphemous. Don't, don't intermix the creator and creature distinction. Place me in a position of awe in your life. I'm to be held as holy in a position of awe compared to any other things. You, see, you hear that? Let me just repeat that again in wedding vow language. I love you because I love you. So make me your one and only. Don't equate me with anything else and be in absolute awe of me. Are these commands? Absolutely. Are these wedding vows? Yes, they are. A, a preacher uh, once described covenantal marriage vows, right, and the covenantal relationship between a husband and a wife as this. It's way oversimplified, but I think it's sufficient for our discussion today. Covenant vows, covenant marital vows, is more binding than emotionalism and yet more affectionate than a contract. It's more binding, it's more legally binding than emotionalism, but it's also much more affectionate than a contract. It's more binding than just emotionalism because it says, if you're, if you're really that committed to me, if you, if, you really, if you really are that committed to me, then sign the dotted line. Sign it. Sign the dotted line, vow to me, say I do, make a commitment to love me even when the lovey-dovey butterflies in your belly flies away. Are you that committed to me? Will you fight for me even when your own heart gives up? It's more binding than just emotionalism. Emotionalism is, is for children. But it's also much more affectionate than a mere contract. It's different than a work contract. You know, work contracts, the wording, the content, they're not interested in the emotions, right? The content is often pragmatic. I'll, I'll commit coming to the office from nine to five. I'll commit finishing this project by this date. Okay, sign there. But a covenantal contract isn't like that. Marriage vows are not filled with practical content. Can you imagine that? You know, you're at a wedding. 
you're at the dinner after the holy matrimony, the groom gets up and, you know, takes a small piece of paper from his pocket and unfolds it. Everyone's excited, you know, what's he going to say? And the groom says, honey, here's what I can practically offer to the table. Uh, I can split our finances 50-50. I can put the house under both of our names, and I'll let you choose where we eat 65% of the time. That's what I can do, sign it or leave it. That's not what you expect in a wedding. The content isn't just practical. The, what's the content? It's emotional. I will vow, honey, to make you my one and only, to love you because I love you. I will vow to set you apart from anyone else. I will vow to place you in a position of awe. You see, it's, it's more affectionate than a contract, and it's more binding than just mere emotionalism. And if you look at these Ten Commandments, what you'll find is that it's covenantal. It's much more binding than emotions, but it's much more affectionate than just a contract. Look at the binding legal language here. Look at verse 5. Look at what God said there. If you make carved idols, I will visit your iniquity. By the way, that's the same phrase God used to threaten Egypt. What did God do when God visited their iniquity? He destroyed them. If you break this, I'll... I'll destroy you. You're done. That's legal courtroom language. Okay, look at verse 7. If, if you take my name in vain, I will not hold you guiltless. You'll be guilty. Innocence and guilt, that's, that's courtroom legal language. There's a consequence to breaking the Ten Commandments. It, you see, it includes legally binding language, but it's also affectionate in nature. It's not just a contract, legal contract, like a work contract. Look at the content. I love you because I love you. Make me your one and only. Set me, bar- set me apart from other things. Be in awe of me, you see. Ten Commandments, covenantal marriage document. And if Israel is to commit to this covenantal relationship with God, they will be slowly changed more and more into the likeness of God, which leads us to our fourth point. If Israel remains faithful in, in, this, in this marriage, they'll be constantly changed more and more into the likeness of God. Point four, a holistic change. Verse eight to 10. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servants or your female servants or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. Remember the Sabbath day. Now, husbands, I learned this the hard way, but when your wife says, honey, remember your, our anniversary, apparently what she means is not just for me to cognitively remember it in my head. When she says, remember our anniversary, she didn't, she didn't mean, you know, I can't go to her and say, honey, I remembered it. <laughs> She'd be like, great. That's not the point. What does she mean when she says, remember our anniversary? Is plan something for it. <laughs> book, a, book a date at a restaurant. Make it special. Don't just do your everyday work like you usually do. Set it apart. Make it holy. Make it distinct. Spend time with me. Okay. Um, and another way, another thing I learned the hard way is you can't respond like this. You can't say, but honey, I spend every day with you. That won't fly. <laughs> the point is they want you to spend time with them in a special way for that day. Okay. So is God present with us every day? Of course. Are we, are we with him every day? Yes. But when God says, remember the Sabbath day, there's something special God is saying about this day. Remember it. Spend it worshiping me. Don't do your normal everyday work activities. <laughs> yes, I spend that every day with you, but make today special. Okay? By the way, this command also has a humanitarian aspect to it. Look at verse 10 again. Let me just point this out because I feel like I need to. You also have to give rest to your servants. That's interesting. You have to give rest to any outsourced workers, any outsourced staff you have, sojourners that come into your gates. Don't make them work. The rest I gave you from the burdens of your slavery, extend that rest to them as well. You see? Okay. So as much as this command, let me just package it and then then talk about what I mean by point four, a holistic change. As much as this command is about our weekly scheduling and even maybe perhaps uh, an employment SOP, I don't know, to some extent, it is though much more than that. Okay? Because look at the reasoning of why Israel is called to obey the Sabbath. This is your week, how are you supposed to pattern it? But why is that, am I supposed to pattern my week like that? Look at verse 11. Not primarily for personal rest, not primarily just create a SOP for your employment. The main reason why you are to observe the Sabbath week pattern is because, verse 11, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, 
the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. That's the pattern of Genesis 1, of the creation week. Do you remember that? When God worked, created six days, and then rested on the last day. Now, pay attention carefully. Here's my point. The reasoning of why Israel should observe the Sabbath weekly pattern is because that was the pattern of creation found in Genesis chapter 1. Israel is to pattern their schedule based on the pattern of new creation. It's saying you are a newly created people. But not only that, whose actions is Israel meant to mimic here? God's actions. God worked for six days and rested on the seventh, so you should follow what I do. Now, this should flatter Israel. Wouldn't you be flattered if God said, don't just do what I say, but do what I do? It's like, oh my goodness, God is saying, I don't, I don't want to just tell you what to do. I want you to be more like who I am. You see that? Pattern yourself more after me. In other words, don't be holy just because I'm telling you to be holy. What does the Bible say? Be holy because I am holy. It's not what the Lord says. See, this is what Israel will experience. When they commit themselves to this covenantal relationship with God, Israel will not only be modified in their behavior, they'll always be continually renewed in their being. See, other gods and other nations, they're not interested in making their followers be more like them. They just want obedience from them for reward. But Yahweh wants his people not only to obey him, but to also mirror him. And this is true for marriage too, isn't it? I've seen many married couples who've been married for years. Their mannerisms, their behavior, the way they laugh, their sense of humor, their worldviews, they all just kind of start to emerge. They all just kind of start being more like one another. For example, after Tati is married to me, her sense of humor has improved so much. Her taste in art is so much more refined now, just more like me. No, I'm just, I'm kidding. But that is, that is true, isn't it? That we become more like the person we marry. That's just how we are. But in this case with God and Israel, only Israel's change to be more like God because God is unchangeable, okay? What, what God is saying here is this. If you commit yourself to this covenantal marriage vows, not only will you end up doing more what I ask, but you'll also become more like me. You see? So, so let's summarize it. My people, God is saying here, be holy, be distinct, be different. How? Verse 1 and 2, by rejecting legalism. I love you because I love you. Verse 3, by rejecting polytheism. Make me your one and only. Verse 4 and 7, by rejecting pantheism. Hold me in a position of esteem and awe. Verse 8 to 11, reject behaviorism. Be transformed holistically into my likeness. I don't want mere slaves. I want image bearers to go through the world. Okay, now, so far so good. All would have been well, except guess how long Israel lasted before they broke these covenant vows? Remember, we're in Exodus chapter 20 now, right? Fast forward 12 chapters. Remember what happened in Exodus chapter 32? They created a false god a few days it lasted a few days, maybe a few months, I'm not sure. But they, 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 they created Baal, a golden calf, and worshipped this. They broke everything God told them to keep. Imagine that. Your spouse cheating on you just a little bit after the wedding. <laughs> you know what you think to yourself? You'd probably think this to yourself. Man, if I knew they were going to do this, I wouldn't have married them in the first place. If I just knew, if I just had the information... But see, this is what's absolutely mind-blowing, is that God knew. God knew Israel was going to cheat on him. Remember, he's Yahweh. He's all-sufficient. He's all-knowing. God already knew that Israel was going to cheat on him a few moments after the wedding vows were said, which leads us to our last point, an infinite cost. Have you ever entered into a romantic relationship knowing that the person you enter into that relationship with is a fixer-upper. <laughs> if you're currently in a relationship, don't raise your hands. Just answer it silently in your hearts. The Lord knows all things. A fixer-upper is someone who you love, but perhaps they have a lot of hurts, habits, and hang-ups that need fixing and healing, okay? That need improving. Now, it's not mean to call somebody a fixer-upper. Let me tell you, everybody is a fixer-upper. 
okay? Everybody has hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Everybody needs healing, fixing, improving. If you don't think your partner is a, needs any fixing, fixing, healing, or improving, that means you don't know them very well yet. So when you become aware of who your partner is, and you become aware of their imperfections, right, and you decide to commit to them still, even after knowing their imperfections, see what happens at that moment is that you've made an internal commitment to yourself like this. You, you say something like this, okay, I see how he or she falls short, I see how they're imperfect, but I choose to stay with them and therefore endure whatever future sacrifices is required of me, right? That, that's what you're saying. When, you're, when, when you see someone's imperfections and choose to move forward in a relationship with them, you're making a silent vow to yourself that you will pay the cost and endure these imperfections. See, Yahweh, he is very much aware of the imperfections of Israel, of his people. He knows all of our hurts and habits and hang-ups. And even after knowing all of it, even after knowing that we will cheat on him just a few days after the wedding, he still chose to commit to us. That means he knew what it was going to cost him, and he committed to it. Remember what we said earlier, you know, don't make false images of me, God says. Don't humiliate me by bringing me down into creation. You mustn't do it. It's humiliating. What cost did God pay in order to be with us? You know what he did in Philippians chapter 2? Philippians chapter 2 says this about Jesus Christ, that although he is God, he's equal with God, he, what, humbled himself and took on a form, the form of a servant. He was born as a man. People say the humiliation of Christ happened at the cross. No, it did not. The humiliation of Christ happened in his birth. That God would take human flesh? Are you kidding me? You know how humiliating? A self, a decision to, 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 to condescend. He knew. He knew since Exodus chapter 20, he knew what he was going to have to do in order to move forward in this wedding. And why did God come down to us? To exemplify to us what a moral life looks like? Yes, but that's not all. Remember, God wants to change your, not just your behavior, but your whole being. Jesus came to do what? To die. Why? So that you may be recreated. Not only in your behavior, but in your being. I was dead in my sin, Paul says. But through the death of Christ, I now live. God's love doesn't just change an immoral person to a moral person. It brings dead people to life. God knew what it was going to cost him to move forward with this wedding. But he wedded you anyways. Oh my. God knew what it was going to cost him to love you, but he did it anyways. Why? Why? Here's why. Because he loves you. Because he loves you. Because he loves you. From the beginning of time, the king of glory, uncoerced by anything, decided to love you at whatever cost. Why? Because he is love. You see, he's different. So you then, his people, be different. Stop playing around with legalism. He doesn't love you because of your obedience. He loves you because he loves you. And because of that, make him your one and only. Don't place your sense of ultimacy in anything else for identity, purpose, hope. And let this truth cause you to place him in a position of awe above all else. Because a covenantal relationship with him will change not only your behavior, but your whole being from death to life, wedded to a God who stepped down from glory to wear your sin and bear your shame. Have you done that today? I hope you say, I do. I hope you say, I do to what? To obeying the commandments? Yes. But I also hope you say I do to the wedding vows God is initiating with you through the death of Christ. I love you. Will you rest in this? Will you receive it? I know this feels different than every other religion out there. Everyone else tells you you have to obey me to get to me. I'm telling you you can't, so I'm coming down to you. Will you rest in that? Then and only then will you be changed, not just in your behavior, in your being, 
then and only then will you find the power to obey these commands through the death of Christ. Will you receive it? I pray you do. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you realizing you've given us commands so that we may be distinct from the nations around us, but yet we fail and we often make other things into gods. We often place our hope and our sense of ultimacy in created things. We elevate things. We disrespect you in your name and, and humiliate you and, and we fall into legalism where we believe you love us because of something we've done or you don't love us because of something we haven't done or vice versa. Father, I pray that you make this message clear as it is pertaining to your holy word, that you are different and so therefore we are to be different and that starts with a different initiation to the relationship. Obedience, our obedience does not coerce you to love us, but you love us freely of your own will and because of that we now obey. I have freed you from Egypt so now obey. Father, let this pattern speak loudly to our hearts. In your son's name we pray. Amen.